Good evening or good morning, wherever you're joining us from any, uh, in the world. My name is uh, Timothy Beckley. I'm the Vice President of Global Print Technologies and Workflows at ID Alliance. Uh, this is another brand Q webinar series. This one on the deltas and uh, when to use them, where to use them, and what causes issues. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Ron Ellis from Ron Ellis Consulting, uh, Mark Levine from Shock, and Steve Rankin uh, from Teshcon as the panelists today. Uh, everyone is, is on mute who's joined the call, and we've got uh, a, a large number of participants continuing to join the call. You can submit questions uh, at any time into the, uh, the chat box, and we'll answer those uh, at the end. We, we always leave a lot of time at the end to answer all questions. And um, this uh, webinar is also being recorded, and at the very end of this, uh, the list is sent out to, to me, and I'll send it out to all registrants who uh, signed up for the event, even if they didn't get a chance to join us. Based, typically, it's usually based upon time frame or something going on during the day. So thank you for joining us, and uh, with that, I'll pass it off to Ron Ellis. Okay, great. So my name is Ron Ellis, and uh, I'm a consultant uh, who works mostly between Boston and New York, and does quite a bit with ID Alliance as well, and I'm Print Properties Chair and Energy 7 expert and trainer. Um, and I'll talk in just a minute about our agenda, but the guys we have on here today are Mark Levine, whoops, um, who's Director of Enterprise Print Quality at Shock, and he's one of the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable guys about brand issues that, that I actually go to and talk to quite a bit. Uh, prior to Shock, he was at x rite and before that at Monaco and Noor, and Deep, deep experience, deep knowledge, really good at these topics, which is why we have him with us so much. Uh, we also have uh, Steve Rankin, who's Director of Product Development at Teshcon USA. And like Mark, a lot of experience. He worked at X-Rite, uh, came from Monaco, EFI, uh, you know, same deep uh, color background. So these guys are really, really good guys for these topics. And if you have questions, as we mentioned, uh, text those in as we go, because we'll go for about 45 minutes with uh, content about these different topics, and then after we get through that, then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. So some of these topics, there are a lot of questions about them that I run into day after day, so I know that there's there are good topics for this. What we're going to talk about is, uh, first, I'll start off, and I'll talk about Delta L and Delta CH. And then uh, Steve Rankin will go second. I have the order flipped here a little bit. He's going to talk about the Delta H's, which are kind of an unknown topic, and that's why we're hitting it, is a lot of brands ask questions about them. There's some brands in Europe that are beginning to specify these, and uh, much of the supply chain and many of the instruments and software don't really do much, and people don't know much about them and get them confused. Uh, Mark Levine will talk about good old Delta E, and uh, where it comes from, what it is, and, and what it works well for, and maybe ideas of where it can get you into trouble. So we'll get started. Before we start, we'll talk about Brand Q for about three minutes here. So Brand Q is Idea Alliance's program that's designed for brands. And the whole mission of Idea Alliance Brand Q is to communicate, and that's to help brands and their supply chains communicate, to educate, and that's to get same thing, brands and suppliers educated, and to help validate results. Uh, for example, the, the G7 Master Program has uh, the ability where we actually get samples to come in, and there are brands who actually take advantage of using ID Alliance and G7 and, and having things validated at that point, too. Uh, if you look at education, this is a picture of one of our trainings. And if you take a look here, you can see these are uh, uh, brands staff who are coming in here learning how to measure and talk about color and communicate color so they can go back to their supply chain and, uh, and be able to, to talk to them and know the language and, and know what's, what's a good tolerance, what's realistic, what's not. Uh, this is Communicate. That's Mark right in the middle there. Uh, you can see Biggie on the left from GMG and I think Peter Pretz is in there but, uh, and a bunch of brand people. And they're talking about a print issue there. So this is the big idea of communicating. What do we like? What don't we like? What do we expect? Um, in a language that everybody understands. Validate is where we look at and learn to measure. This is the print kit from the Brand Q Education, but being able to measure and check and see that the print has met what this, the expectations that we have. But so 
with brand two, keep it in mind, it's a training program. Uh, it's also a, a validation and certification program. So we actually have a part where we uh, validate suppliers and we certify people as, uh, as trained people. But the big idea is getting people to understand what, what they need, how to ask for it, and to get the back and forth between the brand and the supply chain. So before we start, the big idea is why are we talking about Delta today? <clears throat> and the big, big reason is Delta is a very big part of Communicate. If you notice uh, when I talked about Delta H, I said because brands are asking for it and specifying it. And Delta E is the same thing where a brand will go out and say, we want you to match this color within a certain Delta E. So brand is a big part of the communication that goes on between supply chain. I mean, not brand, uh, Delta is a big part of the communication that goes on between the supply chain and the brand. So that's why we're focusing on it today. And what we hope you get out of it is, it's kind of answers to these questions that we hear all day long. As I'm in printing plants and working with brands, I hear these same questions over and over about these different issues. So I'm gonna start off with Delta CH and Delta L. And these are probably the, you know, probably the least interesting or least important out of the things we're covering today. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about why it matters and why it's important, and then how you would assess it. So how you would look at it and uh, what you'd actually be watching for or what you'd care about. So these are two different formulas that are used and they're used quite a bit in G7. And most of the G7 software and tools that are out there can report and, and measure and, and give you information on these two deltas. So the first one we have here, this is delta CH. So this is the formula right here. And if you notice one thing about it, delta CH is focused on color. So we know we have LAB, if you look at our little chart here, we have the L, we have our A, and we have our V. But if you notice one thing about delta CH as compared to typical delta formulas, delta CH is only concerned with the A and the B. So in delta CH, there's no concern for the L. L being the tonality or lightness, darkness. So the, this is the basic delta CH formula. Probably a big thing to think when you look at it, it's a lot like delta E, except for there is no tonality or lightness, darkness in here. So that's our, our basic look at delta CH. What it's used for is reporting on gray balance. So it's used for the color of the gray. That's the main thing that we're doing with delta CH. If we look at the delta L formula, the delta L formula is exactly the opposite. So on the delta L formula, you can see that what we have here is just the L. There is no A or B. That's the only thing we care about. And so that's lightness. So <clears throat> delta L formula is used for assessing tonality. So the notice that there's no AB, the only thing we care about is lightness on delta L. So if you look at these, delta CH, the formula for gray balance, only cares about the color of the gray. Delta L is the formula for tonality. And delta L only cares about lightness, darkness, the L value. So they're kind of broken apart from what a typical delta E formula would, would be, but uh, they're used for those two purposes. Very often in almost all of the G7 software that's out there, we're applying something called a weighting function. And the weighting function is where we uh, apply some calculations to it and it reduces the significance of errors that happen above 50%. So if you look at the image here, this is uh, from the G7 pass fail document. This is Don's image that he had made. If you take a look at it, you can see everything about 50 is scaled differently. And if you look at the formulas down on the bottom, we have the weighted delta L and weighted delta CH. And the W stands for weighted. You can see in here that it's applying a, a formula that compensates for being in that area. So being above 50, the significant scales, depending on the percent that we're at, so almost always when you're looking at this in software, you're gonna see a W in front of it, which is the weighting function. In G7 master and the G7 programs, we use these weighting functions and that's why most of the software also has the weighting function in it. And when you look at these formulas, the other thing, of course, uh, most people don't, aren't super duper at doing all the math, but you're not usually doing the math yourself unless you like spreadsheets like maybe Mark does and, and some other people. But uh, 
very often you're using the software that you use. So uh, using software and the tools, and these would show up in your handheld spectros, these would show up in all your process control software, you'd see these numbers. So you're not having to remember the formulas or, or do the math. You just need to know what it means. So just to, why these matter? Why are these important? Because they're just little formulas, they're just math. But there's actually a reason that these formulas matter and a reason that these formulas are important for us. <clears throat> and a reason that print buyers care about them. That first formula of delta L is tonality. So tonality is this neutral print density curve. So that's this little curve here. Based on our density, there's a tonal format that's applied. And in the world of G7, that's pretty much always the same in the highlight in most of the midtone, unless we're doing really low density printing. Uh, so that's tonality, and that gives us something that's really, really important. Uh, when we look at how we see these, take a look in here. You can see this is a G7 master pass fail report. And notice that you'll see them in here. And you can see our delta L and our delta CH, and you can see the numbers and the tolerances that are in here. So in software, that's typically how you see them. And I'll, I'll show a couple more examples as we go along here. Uh, so looking at some other programs here, typically how you're going to see it. So you can see over here, it's got our delta L, and it's giving a pass or a fail, and our delta CH, and that's how it's going to look. Uh, behind it is another program. This is, this is from Curve up here. Down here is spot on, and you can see the NPD. Neutral print density curve, and that's got its delta L. Then you can see CMY gray balance, and it's got delta CH there. So that's that's how we'd see this in software. The reason this matters so much, and the reason these metrics matter, is that these are how we control shared neutral appearance, uh, and this is how we get that same look across the many print methods that we use. So we define our gray, and the gray is relative, of course, to the paper. And we get our tonality, which is what makes it look the same, whether we're doing flexo or litho or wide gamut, wide format printing, uh, we can get the same thing. So the, the big reason, the big key to G7 and the big mechanics that really make G7 work are tonality and gray balance. And the way we check those is with delta CH and, and delta L. So these big attributes, the NPDC and the gray balance, are really important and they work really well with litho, but the reason that G7 is so popular is it works with other types of printing besides litho. So as we go into different print methods, that's how we get our shared common appearance or shared visual appearance. And that's pretty much the main reason brands like G7, one of the big reasons. That means I could have one piece of artwork and I could go to gravure, I could go to litho, I could go to wide format presentation printing and banners and get about the same output. Not perfect, and there's some limitations, but that means I could have one piece of artwork instead of having 15 or 20 pieces of artwork, depending on the print method. So gray balance makes the gray look natural on the paper that we're on. See here that on a blue paper, the gray balance and the delta C that we're checking, basically on a blue paper, gray balance is a little bluer. It makes it look natural. Normal paper, we're more neutral, yellow paper, the gray balance is yellow. If I had this gray balance over here, this gray balance would actually look a little bit too yellow for the paper. That's one of those magic things that we're checking with delta CH. Uh, and then the other part is the delta L, which is the tonality. And that's what gives us that similar look. So if you look in here and if you look between all these different print methods, this is Grackle over here. This is uncoded. This is news, heat set newsprint. All these look similar, especially in the mid-tones and the highlights, and that's that shared, shared neutral appearance. And if you look where you would see the difference, it tends to be in the shadows, which is the gamut of the device and the paper being different. But that's kind of the big important thing, the part of G7 that's really, really important. And that's the reason that we're checking delta L and delta CH. If we have those two, two things correct, then we're gonna actually have the magic of G7. It's supposed to let us get this common appearance across many different types of printing and many different plants all over the world. So I'm going to have a switch over now to Steve Rankin, and he'll talk a little bit about the mysterious Delta H. Oh, 
All right, Steve, I'm Great. passing you the controls there. And at the top, where it says File, Edit, Share, just choose Share at the drop-down menu and My Screen. Fantastic. Perfect. We see your screen. Okay. You see my screen. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Ron. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of our attendees for joining as well this afternoon. Um, I am going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about um, the CIE LAB and LCH color space. Um, then we're going to get into the uh, Delta H. Um, there's two different kinds of Delta H. We're going to talk about those and uh, what color differences look like in uh, C-Lab and LCH as well. So I'm yeah, going to jump not presenting, in here. Steve. Steve. Um, yes. For some reason, it's uh, it's not actually presenting. It's showing us your presenter view. Yeah, so huh. Just put it in slideshow mode or like a Say slideshow. Swap, swap displays or, yeah, slideshow. You go up top there. Hold on. So, there you go. and then, um, yep, perfect. Do you, do you see yep, it now? Much good. Yep, perfect. All right, yep. great. Very good. Okay, so just a, a quick overview, right, about CIE LAB. Whoops. Um, this is a three uh, coordinate uh, color space system. Um, you have uh, A star, which uh, has both positive and negative. Positive A star colors are red, uh, negative A star colors are green, and with B star you have uh, positive uh, B star colors are yellow, negative B star colors are blue, uh, and then there's a lightness axis which runs uh, through the middle of this. If you uh, go ahead and kind of plot color on those three axes, it looks something like this on the left. Um, if you take a slice out of this and then turn it on its side so you're staring down at the slice, um, it looks, you know, something like the image over here on the right. And you can see that there's, you know, almost like graph paper which has been overlaid on top of this. Um, there are numbers that correspond to these axes and as the, uh, the numbers get bigger, uh, you can see the saturation goes up, right? So neutral colors are in the center of the axis and uh, more saturated colors are, are towards the outside uh, of this um, color space. And then, um, you know, we also have overlaid, uh, you know, the LCH um, nomenclature on this, uh, on this axis. So uh, you can see at, at the red, uh, on the red axis here, this is zero degrees. This is how we measure hue. So hues run around the outside uh, of this color space um, with uh, 90 degrees being up here at yellow, 180 here at green, and uh, blue is at, uh, at 270. So hue is measured uh, in degrees going around. We're going to talk more about this. And then uh, chroma, right, this is the saturation, how saturated a color is. It's measured uh, as a distance from the center of the axis here, from gray, out to wherever the color plots. So let's just a uh, quick recap here, right? So that both systems are uh, three coordinate systems. Um, the lightness numbers are exactly the same between CIE LAB and LCH. Um, to communicate the, you know, more the color, the hue, the saturation with CIE LAB, we use the A star and B star uh, axis, and with LCH, we use the chroma factor and the hue angle. So next up, uh, you know, I've got a color here that I want to measure, and uh, I'll use my spectrophotometer, measure one of these reds, and when I do, uh, I'm going to get a simple plot of where this color is uh, in my uh, my LAB color space. So again, we're, we're kind of looking at this uh, C-Lab color space turned on its side. L is actually coming through your monitor, right? So we're looking at a, a slice uh, of L. 
and <clears throat> I can see that the uh, the distance from the center, right? Here's the uh, the center down the a-axis is 67.89, and the distance up on the b-axis is 38.52. So you know these are numbers that you've probably seen and, and communicated before, right? These are the LAB numbers. We can, uh, with some simple math, convert those to LCH numbers. So again, chroma comes, uh, it's a distance. It comes from the center out to where that red is, uh, is plotted here. And the distance here is about 78. <clears throat> and then the, uh, the hue angle, right? So zero is here at red. So this is somewhere off of zero. It's actually 29.57 degrees uh, away from zero. So if we just take a, a peek at uh, delta E, right? Delta E is the uh, the total color difference. Again, here's our uh, our reference color. It's been uh, plotted here on our LAB graph. Here's another color, right? So we're going to compare, right? We want to know the difference between these two colors, and that difference is. Uh, it's made up of the sum, right? It's kind of the sum of the delta L, delta A, and delta B. So this is the delta B distance here. We've got the delta A distance here. Um, delta L is, uh, we, have, we know that as well, but it's not shown here. And from that, we can figure out what the delta E uh, is, what that distance is between these two colors. And we can do uh, something similar here in uh, LCH color space as well. So again, here's our reference color. And if we add the, uh, the sample, this time we have a hue angle. So there's uh, some kind of a hue angle difference between them. I think the reference was around 29 uh, from the previous slide. So this is 90 here. I'm gonna just you know eyeball and say this might be 70 or something. So there's gonna be some distance. Um, but that hue angle difference doesn't help us um, to calculate delta E. Instead, we need a distance to calculate delta E, and that's where this uh, delta cap H comes in, this delta H star. So this is actually a distance. This is a hue distance, um, which has been measured between my sample and reference. And I'm going to use my delta chroma difference. So that's the, this, this, this distance here. And once I know those distances, some simple geometry will let me get to the, uh, the delta E for these two colors. So the delta E result is the same, regardless uh, if I use the delta, uh, if I was in CIE LAB space or CIE LCH space, uh, that delta E is the same. Uh, we just get there two different ways. So just uh, you know, a couple more thoughts about delta H, um, or this is little, little h versus big H. So uh, both can have a positive or negative sign, which can indicate direction uh, of a hue shift, um, which you know may be easier than looking at delta A and delta B numbers, right? For some people, it's just easier to think of that. Uh, you know, for that red, for example, if, if you know the the H of that red on the previous screen, which was 29, and you hear that the, the hue angle has shifted by, you know, plus 10 degrees, you know automatically it's, it's shifted towards yellow. And uh, sometimes that's easier than looking at, you know, uh, a, delta A and delta B numbers to see uh, what's going on. The, uh, the one place you can get in trouble uh, relative to this uh, positive and negative sign is when the numbers, when the, the colors are, on either side of the uh, the zero and the 360 um, over by the reds. So if, if they're on on either side of that, then these numbers can be a little misleading. But for the most part, uh, you'll see positive and negative numbers, and they will relate to you know positive is a counterclockwise shift, uh, like in our case from red up to yellow, and a negative uh, number is a clockwise shift. So uh, another point here is delta H. Uh, delta, the big, big delta, delta H uh, provides the hue shift as well as like the magnitude of the shift as it's related to delta E, because that's the number that's actually used to calculate the delta E. Um, so let's just take a look at this here. Uh, here's two colors, right, our uh, red and orange. 
and they've got some kind of delta H angle, right? There's some kind of hue angle difference between those two. And this is the delta H, this is the hue distance between those two, right? So that's what you use to calculate your delta E. Now just push the chroma on these colors a little further out and do the same thing, right? Now look for your delta H. So, you know, what's interesting about these two color pairs, right? For the, for the first colors, they have a, actually for both sets of colors, for both pairs, they have the same delta hue angle, but the delta H itself is, uh, is gonna be very different between these two colors. So just something to, to remember uh, that as saturation increases, uh, that delta H um, may be a little more interesting of a number uh, for you to know what's going on. And it certainly does relate to, uh, to what's happening in your, in your delta E. Okay, so, you know, just a question, uh, you know, LAB or LCH, right, which one is easier to use? Um, you know, this is uh, kind of a personal personal preference, right? So here's a color. Um, you know, th this is our, let's say, our, our reference color, and someone hands us some delta uh, LAB numbers. And we have to look at this and try and figure out, oh, boy, what, what's happened to our color here? Um, you know, delta L quickly tells us that it's lighter. Okay, that's I understand that. Uh, delta A is negative 42. So, okay, I have to remember from my LAB graph that it's shifted in the negative direction on A, so it's moved away from red, uh, so it's towards green, right? But it's moved away from red. It's less saturated, I guess, on the red side. And it's plus 13 on the B star. So this is, uh, you know, higher on B. Let's see, a positive B is yellow. So, okay, so it's going to be a little more yellow and a little less red. Um, you know, conversely, if someone had handed us the LCH numbers, um, and you'll notice it's little h, this is the hue angle, but if someone had given us these uh, numbers, the lightness is the same, I say, okay, it's lighter. Uh, delta chroma is negative 20. So I know immediately it's not as saturated. And the hue angle is plus 34, so I know that it's shifted from red up towards yellow. So I know it's kind of, you know, towards orange and it's lighter. And uh, sure enough, you know, both um, give the same delta E, in this case, pretty big, delta E uh, 49, and they both do describe uh, what that other sample color looks like. So it's kind of a personal, uh, personal preference, uh, you know, which one works for you. A lot of people say that uh, LCH is, uh, is a little more uh, aligned with the human visual system, um, the way we see color. And I think, uh, you know, Mark is going to, you know, touch upon that with some of the delta E uh, formulas that he's going to present um, because they kind of align and, and, uh, and do some tolerancing around, um, around color broken down in, in this fashion. So just a quick review, uh, LAB and LCH, both three uh, coordinate systems, um, simple math, lets you transition from, uh, from one to the other. Uh, delta E results are the same between them. And, uh, you know, you can use the one that, you know, kind of suits your, uh, your preference. Uh, most, you know, measurement devices today and, and software out there will uh, provide numbers in, uh, uh, in both color spaces. And uh, just, you know, keep in mind on this delta H, right? So, uh, Little delta H uh, shows the, the hue shift, um, or the delta, uh, delta little h rather, shows the hue shift. And delta big H shows the hue shift and the magnitude relative to the total delta E, to the total color difference. So I put my email here at the bottom. If anybody has uh, any questions after the, uh, the meeting here, if uh, you want to contact me, feel free. And with that, I, uh, I turn it over to Mark Levine. Okay, Mark, I, uh, thanks sir, Steve. Mark, I just handed you the controls, same thing, uh, up on the upper left, file, edit, share, and just, there you go. And share your screen.
Okay, here we go. How does that look? Looks great. Super duper. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Steve and and Steve. <laughs> um, my name is Mark Levine, and uh, I work for a company called Shock. People may know, uh, may be familiar with a platform, a small business that we operate within Shock called Color Drive. So that's where I spend my time. I'm the director of enterprise print quality, and I sort of lead that business. I provided my email address here in case you get this presentation after the fact and you want to contact me. I'm always interested in, in hearing uh, questions and sort of learning, right? Because a lot of times those questions come with learnings. So I really appreciate anyone who, who reaches out. I sit on the Idea Alliance Print Properties Committee. I just, um, I just love Idea Alliance, right? I think they're making a dent in the world of uh, print and color. Right, and we're sort of collectively on a mission to improve how people work, implement new technologies, bring automation in, and drive supply chain costs down for the packaging industry and a lot of great things. I've had the good fortune to play a role in some of these new emerging standards uh, as a function of being on this print properties and being a co-chair for, for a couple of initiatives, spot color tone value. It's a new way to characterize spot colors and hopefully streamlines the way spot colors are produced across the industry, and also print quality exchange, PQX, and that's going to be a new standard. It's not ratified yet, 20616, but uh, it's coming, right? And this is going to streamline the way brands and printers exchange data to help drive performance and make decisions data-driven, right, all, all the way up and down the supply chain. I am a G7 expert, so I know a little bit about G7, not quite as much as Ron. He lives it every day. Uh, I'm also a G7 process control expert, and I'm uh, also a brand queue expert. I deeply value those those titles and the experiences I've I've um, I've gleaned, you know, from participating in in G7 uh, work. So it's this has just been overall really positive uh, for me, and hopefully I can bring some new information to you today. It's actually really old information, right? My goal here is to help you, my audience who can't speak uh, to me right now, uh, to offer you a picture of the, of the kind of history here and understand that there's people behind these processes. These things aren't black boxes, right? It's, you get these formulas up on screen and I've, you know, in my section I'm mostly dealing with Delta E, which is a huge uh, 2000. That's a huge formula, so I don't even bother displaying that for you. But I've got some links at the end if you're curious about what the formula is. My goal to start off this presentation is to help you understand where Delta E2000 and CIE, some of the things that Steve talked about, uh, where they come from, right? And by the way, uh, when I met Steve, and, and it was about 2000, I really knew nothing about color, right? And Steve was working at a company called Monaco Systems that eventually hired me. But he was way ahead of me on this, so uh, hopefully I, I think I caught up, but uh, I don't know. It's, uh, sometimes I don't know. So anyway, uh, 1913, this is, uh, this is an important date. There was uh, an organization that was formed called the Commission on Illumination, right? The French name is Committee International d'Eclairage, right, or Committee International d'Eclairage. And so it was 105 years ago, right? So there's people that are 105 years old, maybe not on this call, maybe on this call, I don't know. Uh, but you can be as old as sort of modern color management is. It didn't start that long ago. So, you know, it's still sort of evolving. And those of you on the call, if you can find ways to participate, you can steer that evolution. So this, this organization, there were a bunch of pioneers with a deep passion for color and they conducted these exercises. In 1931, they conducted an exercise to basically, you know, find a coordinate system for color, to be able to turn the experience of color into numbers, which, you know, I don't think anyone's done that for smell, right? And I don't know if they've done it for taste. Oh, that, that tastes like a 20, right? But you, you have numbers around color, which is amazing. And so the output of that exercise was this three-dimensional coordinate system called XYZ, and also a matching function that they did. Uh, the study involved gathering groups of people, right? And they showed, you know, the people on the left look at red, and the people on the right look at yellow. And then they kind of scribbled down notes, and they switched the colors and switched the people. And so they built this matching function 
that became known as the standard observer. And in that standard observer definition, there was an agreement that the right viewing angle for color was at this kind of two degrees, right? So you shouldn't look, you know, it's, uh, I won't get into the science, I promised I wouldn't. So, uh, but two degrees is gonna be something that you will hear today when brands specify color because a lot of brands, you know, you wanna specify Delta E, you need LABs, you need to know the colorimetry of the LABs that you're expecting mm -hmm. to measure and compare. And so you need to specify what's the illuminant and what's the observer. And D52 degree is today what most of the brands I work with are using, right? And it's kind of the foundation of color management and graphic arts as we know it. So that happened back in 1931. And the committee, this, uh, this commission didn't stop there. They kept innovating. And in 1964, they did the study again and found that 10 degrees was an even, but they did the study and found there was a difference and that they could be even better, and that 10 degrees was an even better standard observer. But there's a whole host of reasons that we probably don't have time to explore today. Two degree continues to be the standard in graphic arts, while 10 degree is used more, industrial, more in industrial color applications. But that's where these things are coming from, this sort of innovation engine that is the CIE. And finally, in 1976, they developed C lab, which is this three-dimensional ball. You saw it on Steve's presentation. It's got the A, B, and lightness down the middle. And for the first time, you could start to draw differences, just like Steve did with basic geometry and understand the difference in color per this model. And that was called DE76, right? Per the year it was authored, right? It's also called DEAB. And what's also cool about this model is you can use it to plot colors and make comparisons and sort of, uh, if you've got printing machines, you can take lots of different samples from a machine and put a skin over that and sort of look at it as a whole. They call this a gamut, right? And now you have a way to visualize the gamut or range of printable colors in the device. Really awesome stuff. So uh, in 1994 and 2000, uh, studies continued because they found that um, although it was nice to have a numeric difference, that I had some sensitivities that didn't really show up in the numbers. You could get a regular old delta E, and it didn't really correlate to what you're seeing, which kind of compromises the usability of the system by brands and printers as a way to specify and manage color. So this is largely about delta E 2000. And I had this question even internally in exploring different, you know, web pages and things like that. Uh, points of information that you have access to, people talk about it a lot of different ways. Delta E2000 is probably a more conventional way to talk about it, but when you write it, a lot of the tendency is to abbreviate it, so you'll see it as DE2000 or DEOO. It's the same thing. I've seen DE space CIE2000. I've seen CIE DE2000. Uh, I had questions internally at my own company from technical people that like, well, what's the difference between this one and that one? So, you know, by virtue of your attendance here, you are now enlisted to help socialize that there is really no difference. And if anyone uh, in conversation with you tries to make a difference between uh, these various uh, ways to talk about Delta E, you have to squash that, right? This is now your responsibility, right? This is your Santa book, right? I gave my kids the Santa book to help them, you know, anyway. I hope there's no kids on the call. Okay, so the other thing that was sort of important going on at the same time was development by the Society of Dyers and Colorists. This started, you know, before the CIE, right? The CIE we had in 1913. So these guys were thinking about color 30 years before that, in 1884. And although they didn't have the kind of scientific horsepower that the CIE had, once uh, LAB was sort of, or the C Lab was authored in 1976. They started using it, and they they sort of discovered that they had these challenges of lining up the delta E's that they would get by CIE uh, with the human visual experience. So in 1984, which is now you're getting that's a great Van Halen album by the way. Uh, now you're getting into our sort of you know generation. 
they had this color measurement committee, this CMC, and they authored this um, CMC tolerancing method based on ellipses. And so what the ellipses do is they try to take the standard geometry that you saw in Steve's presentation and make it work such that it sort of incorporates the sensitivities of the eye and it gives you a number that makes more sense. So as an exercise to point this out, I put a couple of colors together here. And this is the part where I would normally pull the audience for your opinion, but I can't do that. So I'm just gonna play the role of the audience here and talk about what I see. So these are all, you know, this is three colors. And what I did is it's a completely synthetic exercise done in Photoshop. And I just reduced the chroma of each of these by 10%. And so um, on the far left is red, and obviously, uh, you're welcome. And you can see a small difference. I see a small difference. Now, to some brands, I think this difference would be significant, right? And it really depends on the brand if you're going to go there and say this is not acceptable. Some I know some brands that would say this is not acceptable. I know some brands that would accept it. That's what I see on the red. And in the middle, I don't see a difference. Right, my eye can't pick up a difference. Maybe because I built this and I know what the difference is, I could force myself to see something, but generally speaking, I can't really pick it up with my eye. And then on the far right is gray. Now, I started with the gray in the bottom, which had a little chroma in it. You could see sort of a yellow cast. And when I took that chroma out, if you look on top, now it looks blue. So this is really the same color. It's just a difference in chroma but the result is it really just looks like a plain old different color. So each of these different colors have a different sort of sensory quality with respect to the human eye. And that's what the guys at the, the CMC uh, in that committee figured out. And so they drew these little ellipses, right, which look a little bit like tiny eyeballs. Uh, and this is that wedge of the CIE lab space that Steve showed you before just with tiny ellipses drawn on it. So I've seen this many times before and I never really, I looked at this and I couldn't really make sense of it. Like how does this correlate to the numbers working? I mean, I kind of got it that there's some differences. So I, I figured I'd work that out for myself and show you that today. So this is kind of how the ellipses with CMC work. On the left is a red color. And by the way, this is not the scale. Right, so don't, uh, don't hold me to it. But on the left is a red, and it's got a big ellipse around it. And on the right is a gray, and it's got a small ellipse. So the way CMC tolerancing works is it looks at the first color, right, the reference, and it says, I'm gonna take that ellipse and I'm gonna use that to determine the distance to this other color. So as you can see with the bigger ellipse, you get these bigger units that you're stepping over to the gray, in this case is you know, four, so this is, again, not the scale, delta E of four. Now, what's interesting about CMC is on the bottom, if I go in reverse and I say that the gray is the, is the reference and the red is the color that's some distance away from the reference, now the unit of distance is determined by the gray, so it's tiny. So the same distance, these colors didn't move, right? But the same color distance, if you change the direction of comparison, with, with CMC is different, nine versus four, which just doesn't intuitively make sense. You would think I take two colors, I compare them, I always get the same number, it shouldn't matter what color's first and what color's second. So here's the big improvement, and remember that was 1984, 16 years later, right, and after an interim attempt at DE94 with 2000, this is how 2000 works. So I got my same two things, Right, my same two colors and my two ellipses, and wow, this is just kind of going by itself. Um, so what I do is I average them, right? Ooh, that's smart. So if I average them, then I can use the same ellipse around either one, and when I make that calculation, no matter what the direction, I always get the same number. So this is just sort of one of the benefits, and there's a number of benefits that came with 2000. It's really a much smarter algorithm that does a great job of correlating to your eye. It's bi-directional, so, um, you know, like I said, no matter what, compared with CMC, there's a big advantage there just from intuitive, you know, color measurement, being able to socialize between brand, brands and printers. Uh, I've heard estimates that it's 98% uh, 
uh, correlates to the human experience of color, I couldn't find any hard data. I just kind of heard that in conversation. So I didn't put that number in. And one of the benefits now of, of EE2000 is that it's in all the tools that your supply chains are working with, right? So it used to be the case even 10 years after 2000 was released. In 2010, there was still an assortment of software and hardware tools that didn't support this. So this had to sneak into all the technology used to manage color, and by now it's really done that. One thing I do want to touch on, I just want to reflect an experience I had working with a printer, and they had uh, measured a pair of colors, and they had a delta E. And I had measured the same two colors, and I had a delta E, and guess what, those delta E's are different. And we both had, we're both using delta E 2000, so gosh, it should have been the same. And so the printer, uh, we got on the phone and the, we had a long talk with the printer and they told us, check out your software, check out your settings. And I said, what, right? And this was, uh, I, I didn't know, I just assumed that the software out of the box gave me the right numbers. This was some time ago. And lo and behold, there are these uh, ratios that you can use to adjust the way the formula works. Basically, you know, these ellipses have three dimensions as I've sort of outlined for you here, this hue, chrome, and lightness. And so you can, depending on the industry, different industries want different ratios. It's the way color is managed. It's the cycles colors go through. In graphic arts, the, the ratios are one to one to one. So anybody who's in graphic arts doing this work should be using those ratios. If you're in textiles, it's two to one to one. So because they have a different set of constraints and they're building materials for different requirements. So lo and behold, I found that my software was set to this textile setting of two to one to one. I changed it to one to one to one and our numbers matched and it was a great conversation. And I learned something that day, right? Always check your settings and make sure you get to the roots of the conversation because sometimes you're talking about numbers and you want to, you want to get full alignment. You want to come to a spot where you trust the numbers. So you have to be willing to go to the depth, right, and look at all the settings underneath your numbers. That was a great learning exercise for me. It's also sort of, uh, you know, I wonder uh, the challenge if I'm a packaging manufacturer uh, or if I'm a brand and I have a, a closure that may be a plastic that I'm using, you know, for textile. You know, I'm using textile strategies to develop that versus graphic arts, I've got to bridge that gap. And so you want to go into that with eyes wide open and make good choices. So again, DE2000 is great for everything that has to do with your eyeball, right? When you're, when a printer's producing work in, to a brand tolerance, that packaging, uh, and I'm mostly packaging focused, so you hear me say that a lot, that's going to go on shelf and that's got to, uh, that's got to connect through the customer eye. And so basically when you're on press printing, that's what you're printing against is the tolerance and how the, the, the end user, the customer is gonna see it. So Delta 2000 is great for that. It's also great for understanding the quality of match between a, tar, uh, a proof, right, and a press sheet, right? Because both of those are gonna be reviewed by a human being typically, and you want the numbers to correlate. And also when you're doing color standard matching, right? I have a, a particular process and a color that I know I can't make. I'm trying to print some bright shiny color on like a brown craft board and I have to mix the color and try it on that board to get as close as possible. Delta E uh, 2000 is great for all that stuff. Where it's not great uh, in my opinion is for instruments that have their own eyeballs, right? That don't have like it, you see these spectrophotometers here pictured, like there's no human eyeball on these things. They have their own sensors that have different sensitivities that are not human eye sensitivity. So I, you know, personally, I'd like to see the industry sort of settle on DE76 for uh, specifications related to instruments. Uh, I also think too, DE76 is gonna show deficiencies better because it just uniformly, like Steve showed, geometrically shows difference and if a sensor is deficient in any particular color, whether it's one I can see or not, I want to know that and I want the instrument manufacturers to focus on that but because any of those sort of differences can be an indication that the sensor needs calibration and the stability of the process. 
So that's my little soapbox moment here for, for Delta E76. Don't hate it because it's old, right? It's good for stuff. And finally, the last point I want to make uh, is that a lot of times the discussion around Delta E is happening because there's a brand who has a specification and a printer who's trying to meet a specification. So I was at a conference a few weeks ago and the brand said, well, there's a gentleman from the brand and, and he said, well, my tolerance is um, zero for uh, Delta E, which I totally get, right? Because brands spend a lot of time crafting the design intent. And to the brand, you know, the target is the target, right? It's that singular thing, it's the arrow, right? But on the other side is the printer. And the printer has a machine that has to get loaded up and they have to make this print happen. And the machine has variability. So they're trying to, you know, sort of coach their, or coach their machinery to produce the best result and they're trying to optimize their process to get it to produce within a very tight tolerance. So a printer has succeeded when they've kind of got their print in a circle, right, in, in one of those circles. And just like any athlete, right, if you, you know, invest your time in training and working on your mechanics and you buy the fancy running shoes and you buy the fancy running shirt, you're going to run faster. Right? And you're going to be able to do it for longer, right? It's just what's your investment and your commitment? And typically, you know, it requires more money to get into the little circle than it does to get into one of those bigger circles. So my advice to brands and discussions around Delta E and, and printers too, is just, you know, consider the, the disposition of the partner you're talking to. And I think it is reasonable for a brand to, to say the arrow is my target. But I also think it's reasonable for the printer to say, no, this small circle or this big circle is my target based on the commercial arrangement, you know, we're discussing. And let's talk about how we can sort of come to alignment. So uh, we're at the end of my spot here. I've got a couple of cool links. And um, cool is kind of like a color thing too. So I got a, I got a little double action there. So this is some of the links I discovered as I research this, I think um, there's a lot of good info. It's funny uh, because when you scour the internet and you find people that talk about color, some, you know, promote their, you know, their information as simple, 101, and you find out, well, eh, it's not really. So these are pretty quality links to go to and learn good stuff. And uh, again, my, my emails in the presentation, if people want to reach out to me, love to hear them. Great. Well, I think we can go and, and we can do some questions and answers uh, at this point, Steve. And can you flip it back to my screen just for? Oh, you did. Okay, way ahead of me. Um, we had a. Uh, the, uh, yep. Go ahead. We had a couple of questions that came in. The uh, I'll yeah. start with. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ron, Steve, and Mark. Uh, appreciate and everybody's uh, all the attendees who joined the call. Uh, the first question is: In a digital world, let's say for a Xerox iGen, for example, what color adjustments on the press affect the delta H the most? Good question, and uh, and that's very much like a question about can I even use the delta H on a press? Like, is it too late at that point? But uh, Steve or Mark, either of you guys can jump in on that one. <laughs> then everybody jump at once. I would say uh, yeah. on, a, on a digital printing machine, a lot of that stuff is sort of done already. I would use Delta H as a means to kind of track the stability of it and look at that from a statistical perspective to see what kind of shifts uh, are happening to my process. And you probably have to look at it from a higher level. There may be you know, some changes you can make live in the process, depending on the technology that would influence that, but you'd really have to do some deeper analysis. And, and I wouldn't say that all digital machines have the same controls and would work the same way. Okay, and, then, and there was one question that was asked and, and it may have been answered, but I'll go ahead and ask it just so they can get more, more of an answer to it. Is there a preference between LAB and LCH when it comes to asymmetrical tolerances? 
Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, LCH is a little uh, a little better because um, it, it actually allows for exactly that, asymmetrical tolerances. And, uh, you know, with LAB, you're specifying plus or minus A and plus or minus B, and depending on the, the hue angle, depending on where the color lies, you can have a pretty big block. It can be a pretty, like a square uh, around your target. And that square is allowing for quite a bit of hue shift, which the eye can be pretty sensitive to, to see. So if, if you were to specify, uh, you know, via LCH, um, you can actually specify the, the delta hue angle now. And, you know, that's going to kind of control the, you know, the one attribute that maybe your eye is most sensitive to, you know, depending on the color. Great. Thank you, Steve. Yep. And then another question just came in. Uh, well, actually, a couple more just came in here. Uh, um, the fire in here. Uh, why the LAB value of the same Pantone number is different in the software? Is there a is there any global standard? I think that you know in the software, Adobe Creative Suite is using a UV cut version of the Pantone library. So really, it depends on which version of the Pantone library. So brands very often get hung up in that because there's uh, different versions, even in instruments, that are possible to load. Right. And of course, depending on the software, different software is using different versions. So for example, EFI is using a UV cut version. I mean, not EFI. Uh, EFI is using an M0 version, and they let you pick. Uh, CGS, same thing. GMG is currently a M2 UV cut version. Uh, so you can see that depending on the software, you have to be aware of that because if you're really precise and really going for super low delta E's, then that everybody has to be using the same definition in the same library. Okay, great. And I think that brings us to the end of the questions. That brings us to the bottom of the hour. And um, so for the sake of time and for everybody's time, thank you for joining the call. Thank you for panelists for participating. Uh, the next Brand Q webinar series will be April 20th. Uh, we're, we're looking out for the, uh, the content of what that webinar series will be about. And this, uh, this will go out to everybody who's on this call, those who are registered. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else that Ron you'd like to say or any of the panelists? I do. Actually, I have one question that customers ask me, and I have an answer that I give, but I'd like to hear what these guys have. So my question is, uh, if you're using Delta H in the press room, if the brand specifies Delta H in the press room and they're on press working on it, uh, is Delta H appropriate? And what would you do on press if your Delta H, say, on a spot color was failing? Well, I mean, if, if uh, I guess if Delta H is failing on you on a spot color, uh, you know, maybe it's time to, um, you know, go back to the ink kitchen and see what's happening there. Yep. Um, yep. I was kind of curious w which delta H you were talking about mm -hmm. because we have to we have to talk about little delta H and big delta H always now. Yeah, no. In the case that I've, you know, the case that I've run into, like you said, they get them confused, so they're actually mixing them. But uh, they were saying small delta H in that case. Small delta H, yeah, yeah, and, and small yeah. delta H is definitely more uh, more readily available, right? The, the big delta H is. Yeah is a little hard hard to find um not many okay. instruments uh and and software provide that so yep yeah yep. yeah the the other thing it could be run is if you're running a press and maybe you're getting uh contamination right if one ink station is somehow um getting ink into another station it, it, before you even go back to formula you might look at your process and you know sort of measure the ink off the press and, you know, try to come yeah. to, well, is it a maintenance issue and I need to clean up and uh, restart, or do I actually do need to go back to formula? Right. I think the, the conclusion I came to was the delta H should be done to the drawdown maybe, but by the time you get to the press, it's pretty pretty tough to control it at that point. But anyway, that was just one just to throw in at the end that I hear, I've heard a few times lately. Sure. Yeah, great. Well, thank you again, everybody. I appreciate your time today and 
look forward to the next webinar. Great. Thanks, guys. Great. Take Thank care. you. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.